And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and, he, and God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's a walloping statement to put in there at the end of those three sentences. I mean, the therefore comes as somewhat of a surprise, but there's an injunction there. Well, it's a good injunction, man. You, I'll tell you, people who don't do that, they have a hell of a time in their marriage. And so this is a good thing to know if you are married or if you're planning to get married. It's like, you know, we have very strong orientation towards our parents and for good reason. It's like the injunction here is that secondary as soon as you're married. And, and failure to do that makes your marriage collapse. And then you deserve it to collapse too, as far as I'm concerned, because it's a reflection of your pathological immaturity and your unwillingness to extract yourself from the you know, talon-like grip of parents who are a little bit too much on the interfering side. But the injunction, there's, there's a deep injunction here. It's very complicated. So one of the ideas is that the original Adam wasn't a man, like, like a separate man. It was more like a hermaphroditic being. And in that hermaphroditic being, there was a kind of per undifferentiated perfection. And then that was split into male and female. And then that part of the goal of human beings is to reunite that as the singular unity that reestablishes the initial perfection. And that's actually the goal of marriage from a spiritual perspective. But it is in the matrimonial union of male and female as one that we attain perhaps the most complete meaning of our having been made in the image of God, male and female. Gender is an essential characteristic of individual, premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. In the celestial glory there are three heavens or degrees, and in order to obtain the highest, a man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, and if he does not, he cannot obtain it. Fundamental to us is God's revelation that exaltation can only be attained through faithfulness to the covenants of an eternal marriage between a man and a woman. That divine doctrine is why we teach that gender is an essential characteristic of individual, premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. Marriage is more than your love for each other. In your love, you see only your two selves in the world. But in marriage, you're a link in the chain of the generations, which God causes to come and to pass away to His glory and calls into His kingdom. In your love, you see only the heaven of your own happiness. But in marriage, you are placed at a post of responsibility towards the world and mankind. Your love is your own private possession. But marriage is more than something personal. It is a status, an office. Just as it is the crown and not merely the will to rule that makes the king, so it is marriage and not merely your love for each other that joins you together in the sight of God and man. So love comes from you, but marriage from above, from God. Oh, that's lovely. It's such a good idea. So. I had these friends that went to Sweden to get married. They were, northern, they were from Northern Alberta, but his heritage, they're both their heritages were Swede, Swedish. And in this ceremony, they did this cool thing as they, they were being married and they had to hold a candle up between them, right? While they were being married. And you think, well, okay, what's the candle? Well, it's a source of light, it's a source of illumination, right? It's a source of enlightenment. It's the candle that you put on Christmas trees in, in Europe. So it's the light that emerges in the darkness in the depth of winter. It's a symbol of life in, in, in darkness. It's the reemergence of the sun at the 
at the darkest, coldest time of the year, which is also associated symbolically with the, re with the birth of Christ for all sorts of complicated reasons. And so the candle's all that. And then the next question is, why do you hold it above you? And the answer is because what's above you is what you're below to. So it single simplifies something transcendent. And so why do you both hold on to it? Well, because you're both supposed to hold on to the light, right? And you're supposed to be subordinate to the light. And so you ask, well, who's in charge in a marriage? Well, the light, that's the idea. So you come together as one thing. You're no longer two things. It isn't what's good for you. And it's not what's good for your wife. It's what's good for the marriage. And the marriage is about the combined being, which is the reassembly of the original hermaphroditic, hermaphroditic being at the beginning of time. That's if you enjoyed this video, give it a like and hit the subscribe button. Also, if you want more content, including the podcast, go to thoughtful-faith.com. Thanks for watching.